Status Africa. And we do one main task. We raise missionaries. So we look for people that have the calling, people that have the hunger, the desire to serve God. And we recruit them and train them in the area of Bible translation. Then we deploy them where they may be needed. And we don't just recruit people who will do Bible translation. We recruit people who will do anything in the area of Bible translation. Even engineers, even IT people, uh, social media managers in our, in, our, in our office. We need people who can um, uh, manage our website. All those things, as long as it's within the Bible Transition Ministry, we actually need of that kind of people. So, if you'd be interested, uh, please let me know. And uh, as we do that, I want to ask the media to play a, a clip, a very short clip that um, uh, will talk about us and then we we'll continue from there. Yeah. We've had the Bible in English for over 600 years. But what if we didn't? What if God's Word had never been translated into English? What if we couldn't understand God speaking to us through it? The Bible changes lives, but only if we can understand it. Right now, 1.5 billion people in the world don't have the Bible in their language because it hasn't been translated yet. To them, it's as if God doesn't speak their language. Through the work of Bible translation, many people have parts of the Bible. But how will people come to know God without knowing John 14:6? Psalm 23, or Genesis 1. It's time to change this. We long to see every person have access to God's Word. So we work with churches and Christians around the world, translating the Bible into the languages people understand best, teaching people to read so they can read the Bible, and helping people to apply God's Word to their lives. We do all this so that just like us, people can be transformed through hearing God speak to them in their language. They need you to be part of this work. Go, give, pray. Amen. So that's what we do. Um, and we are looking for people who have the call to Sam. And if you'd be interested, please talk to me or go to our website www.weeklyafrica.org. Or you call me. My number is very simple. You can keep it in your head 07 8 And then I'll be able to tell you anything you may want to know about Bible translation. Hallelujah. Sola Scriptura is the wonderful topic I was given to share with us this morning. And I want to start by saying that Sola Scriptura is not English, it's not Swahili, it's not Kikuyu, it's not uh, Ibukusu. It's actually Latin. And um, that is what the, that is the language that the people who came up with this Solas, they were using another point, and the reformers. And so they came up with that uh, word or that phrase, sola, which means soul or the only. Uh, and that scripture is actually what we translate into English scripture. Just to lay some foundation, I want to read some verses in the Bible just to put to the picture or to bring us to speed about the word of God and its place in our lives as believers. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. The Bible says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the face of the deep, uh, was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God said. God created the universe. What we say in logical terms, ex nihilo, or out of nothing, in the voidness of the reality, 
God called nothing into something. He said that the be, in other words, his word went and created. He said his word and it created what it needed uh, to create. God's word has a purpose for each one of us. We have this Bible for a reason, for a purpose. Every one of us, there is a life that God ordained for us. There is a, a, a roadmap God has drawn for us. And we need to know His Word so that we are able to walk towards that destiny that God has for us. We need this Word. Matthew 4, verse 4, this is Jesus when He was being tempted by Satan and was told, if you are a son of God, then turn these stones into bread and eat because you are hungry. Jesus was on a fasting for 40 days. And Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread, on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. The word of God is able to give us life beyond this flesh. There's a life that goes beyond the last breath. There's a life that goes beyond your last heartbeat. There's a life that goes beyond the last functionality of your brain. That life is in the Word of God. If we read the Bible, if you understand the Bible, we apply the Bible, then we will get that life. Psalm 19, verse 105. Your Word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. Someone had just talked about it here. Psalm 19, 11. I have hidden your Word in my heart that I might not sin against you. The Word is a compass that guides our lives. There are struggles in this life. The life is full of darkness. You know, as bright as the light may look now, the sun out there, it may look very bright, but in spiritual reality, this world is full of darkness. We are literally dropping in darkness. So we need the Word of God to light our paths and to give direction to our lives. Because if we don't have that, you and I know what people are doing that do not know God and do not fear God. Crazy things happen in this world. It's because of the darkness that is in this world. And so we need His Word, every one of us. You know, if your people are slaughtering people, you know, people are being decapitated like chicken by fellow human beings. That is the darkness you're talking about. When you walk in darkness, you are capable of being anything. Because in darkness, there is no color. Did you know that? Did you know light brings colors? That's why in darkness there is no somebody who is smart and another one who is not smart. Everybody is the same. Because in darkness. Light is in the word of God. All of us are in need of that light. Psalm 118, 129 and 130. Your statutes read the word of God. Your word is wonderful. Therefore, I obey it. The unfolding of your words give light. It gives understanding to the simple. The struggles that you're having in this life, the struggles, you know, the, the problems, some people are even depressed because of life issues. And these life issues are real. They are not made up. They are everywhere. Home, we to buy. Surely things are big. When you look at yourself in your social life, I mean, it's not where things are working. And you feel like giving up with life. But when the word of God comes in, it sheds light and it shows you which way to go, which direction. It gives you that small voice that says, This is the way. Walk ye in it. That is what the Word of God does when it is given an opportunity in anybody's life. Psalm 29, I want to read a few verses there. Psalm 29, from verse 1. Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord, glory and strength. And ascribe is just give. Give to the Lord the glory to his name. Worship the Lord in, in the splendor of his holiness. Verse 3. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The glory, rather, the God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. 
The word of God is a camera. The people understand the power of the word of God are the people in the kingdom of darkness. Because they know when the word of God comes in its purity and authority, nothing can stand it. Stand up. Stand up the situation in circumstances, in difficulties. And it could be here probably you're having so many issues, you're almost giving up on your life. I want to welcome you and invite you to the word of God. It has the answer, it has the solution to your issues. The word of God thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. Yeah? The word of God is not just powerful, but it's, it has majesty. Anytime you hear majesty, we are talking of royalty. We are talking of glory, power. We are talking of beauty. The word of God is not only powerful, but it is beautiful. You know, there are things that are very bad, but they are not, they are not beautiful. Like caterpillar, the tracker that do roads and what have you. They can bring down this building. But they don't, they don't look nice like Mercedes. Though they are very powerful. Yeah. But the word of God is both powerful and beautiful. So anytime the word of God is at work, it is doing things powerfully. And everything is beautiful. That combination you only find it in the word of God. Go on ask me, sir. Yeah, and a few brothers who fear the Lord. Go on ask me, sir. The Lord, the voice of the Lord breaks cedars. The Lord breaks the pieces in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. Think of very powerful wood like the mahogany of this world. The Bible says that the word of God is able to split them into pieces. You know? I read a book, um, forget the other. He's talking about the glory of God. He was preaching like I'm doing, and then the glory of God came in the midst of the service. And, and people could not stand it. You know, people are just falling. And as they were experiencing that, the pulpit shattered by the power of the presence of God. So when we say the Lord breaks in pieces the seed of Lebanon, that is how powerful the word of God is. He has exalted his word just like his name, the Bible says. He makes Lebanon leap like a calf, sitting like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord strikes with flashes of lightning. It's not only a thunder, it's also lightning. The lightning is a combination of light and electricity. Yeah. You've had people being hit by, 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 by thunder or by lightning and they die. So the word of God is like that. It's powerful. You know, that situation you are going through, it just needs to be submitted to the word of God. And I mean the word of God in its purity. Because the word of God has been spoken all over, but it is doubled of the purity of God. It is doubled of the honor and the glory of God, the honor of that word. When the word of God is given its rightful place, it changes the place. It changes the place. If the word of God is given a place or a space in a human being, it changes that human being. And in fact, go to the history of the world. Everywhere the gospel of Jesus Christ passed, there was renaissance, there was industrialization, people became smart, even by world standards. That's what the word of God does. So it's the voice of the Lord, the word of God, twists the oaks and sees the forest bare. And in the temple, and in his temple, all cry, glory. Glory to God for his word. Have you read your, the, your Bible recently? Yeah? Let's do a test here. Eh? I want to do something, a survey now. I want you to ask your neighbor, and I'm very serious. You ask him or her, okay? So ask him or her. When last did he or she read the Bible? So each of you should say to the other. 
And I'm going to use that data you're collecting for a survey now in this service. I'm giving you a few seconds to do that. Now, sit down and go back to the Sit down and go back to the Sunday. Just say the truth, and the truth will set you free. All right, good. All right, if your neighbor, your neighbor, not you, your neighbor, has said they have read the Bible the last two days, and by that I mean reading the Bible, not in the fellowship, not in the Bible study, not in the Sunday service that we are reading, I meant on your own, privately. If you have used any other source of reading the I mean any other kind of reading the Bible, please change. Can you talk to anybody and change? Tell them, no, 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 the one I gave you is not the one I said before. So change now. Change, please. Yeah, I meant the one which is your own, on your own, privately, for your own consumption, without anybody around you or anybody forcing you to do it. Okay, we are good now. All right. So if your neighbor says they read the Bible the last two days, what are you? You know, you are raising for your neighbor, remember? Everyone, <laughs> um, you come and meet me. It's like a touch of the crowd. Yeah. Okay. If your neighbor has read, say they read, they have read the Bible for the last in the last four days, four, four days. You know, I'm including those who just read. So you must have included enough. Oh, that's, that looks good. That's like three quarters. Okay, if your neighbor says they have read the Bible in the last one week, you know what I'm going to do? Well, you pray to at least you are also, also included. Okay. All right. I will not ask you the other categories. <laughs> because it is unacceptable to stay at home a week. You are sold, you are in a man has not eaten anything. You're starving that man. Do you know that? That man is hungry. Come on, I'm going to put up for your outer body. Why are you not feeding your inner man? So, let, let us read the Bible. We read it for our good. Now, going back to Sora Scripture, because the reason I'm asking that is because we'll understand why the reading the Bible is so important. The Anglicans in the house know that there's something called the Westminster Confession of Faith. It's a book uh, that put together, it's a document that describes or defines faith and its practice as far as the Anglican Church is concerned, or the Church of England. And this is what it says about the Word of God, or the Scripture. The Westminster Confession of Faith says the whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for his own glory, man's salvation, his faith, and his life is either expressly set down in the scripture or by good and necessary consequence, meaning by extension, by reference, and by uh, elucidation may be deduced from the scripture and to which the scripture nothing at any time is to be added whether by new revelations of the spirit or traditions of men now that is the western news confession of faith he says that the scripture this bible the way it is even if you got a new revelation by the holy spirit you cannot add it here because the way it is, it's okay. It's complete. So, there was a problem some years back, centuries back, in the church. There was only one church, the Roman, I mean, the Catholic church. And so, everything revolves around the church, everything. Whether it is politics, whether it is economy, whether it is education, whether it was education, everything evolved around the, uh, the church. In fact, all the main institutions of learning 
then they were actually founded by the church or in the church. The likes of Oxford, uh, the likes of uh, uh, Cambridge, all those big institutions, Harvard, Preston, all, the, all of them, they were founded in the church. In fact, in that compound, almost all of them, there was a church. Because the church controlled everything. But there was a problem. Because of the human nature. This is what John Calvin said. He was one of the reformers. And this is what he said. Man's nature is a perpetual factory of idols. Man's mind, full as it is of pride and boldness, dares to imagine a God according to his own capacity. Left to yourself, to myself, who create a God of our own. Which is happening today. You know, the other day I was talking to some people, and I was telling them, when I listen to preachers, including in my own denomination, including the so called Pentecostals, the most spiritual people, you know, what were my mingi, or mingi, maubi mingi, everything mingi. Even those people, there is a place we have put God. We are almost nowadays telling God, you operate under our terms. You, 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 you don't detect things here. You God. We say what you do or how we worship you. We worship you and our terms. This is how we want to worship you. But the Bible is clear. How we should worship God. How we should give to God. The Bible is clear what it means to be of given of sin. What it means to be saved. The Bible is clear. Let's, let us not add things that the Bible does not say. Because that is exactly what has happened. You had to repent to the father or the priest. You had to pray to the mother of Jesus and some names of some, uh, some saints. You know, when you are born, you are baptized by the church. You are, you are dedicated by the church. Then, when you are, when you are about a youth, then you are, uh, you are commissioned by the, by, by the, by the church. Your marriage conducted. I mean, the church was literally controlling you on everything. And then they say the Bible or the scripture can only be interpreted by a specific people or group of people the priest, the Pope, and the clergy. The laity or the congregants didn't have room to read the Bible. When I was young, I was a Catholic. And I found a time when, in fact, I remember, I found when the priest was reading the Bible in Latin. But in Azucho, and the, my grandfather, they are going to a church where Latin is the language. And in that church, only few people would read the Bible. The Bible was on the old pit. This is the place. And in a church like that, where the Bible stays on the pulpit, and it cannot be removed. Do you know there are churches even carrying the Bible as a ceremony? And some of you come from that, those kind of churches. And by the way, I'm not saying you stop those ceremonies. Don't go saying those ceremonies are nothing, they are null and void, they are. Don't say those things. The point is, the Bible is meant to be in your hands. To be read. And to be believed in. And to be practiced. Read the Bible. Believe the Bible. Practice the Bible. I want to personalize that and say, I will read the Bible. I will believe the Bible. I will practice the Bible. You can say that with me. One, two, go. I will read the Bible. I will believe the Bible. I will practice the Bible. Now say it alone. One, two, go. I will read the Bible. I will believe the Bible. I will practice the Bible. Who's the man come 
whole university is doing what? Come on, you're doing what? <laughs> a whole university known for engineering and all those big things. Can you say it with oomph? One, two, say it. I will read the Bible. I will read the Bible. I will practice my Bible. Amen. Make me so. Say my amen. Amen. So, the reformers, and these are the people who looked at this, let the Bible and they said, no, 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 this can't continue like this. And by the way, we're in such a period now. We need another reformation in the Church of Jesus Christ. We need another reformation. The way people are doing and running the Church of Jesus Christ like a private prisoners. No, we cannot continue like that. The way the Word of God is being rendered like merchandise by hookers. We cannot allow that to continue. No, that shouldn't happen. Where blessings are being sold in the name of a seed, where blessings are prescribed by the church, by the pastor of the man of God. No, that's not what the Bible says. No, we cannot allow that to continue. You and me, we are the people to bring this revolution. By taking the Bible seriously. And that's what the reformers did. They said there are things which we must do. And they came up with five solas. One of them is Sola Scriptura, the one you're talking about. The next one, I'll talk about Sola Scriptura. The next one is Sola Christus. Sola Christus means Jesus only. And this is what they meant. The work of Christ and Christ alone is the basis on which the ungodly are justified in God's sight. Period. Not your time, not your giving, not your dedication in the church, and all those things we will do. But those things are done by people who have already been accepted by Christ. It is not, it is not that which causes that giving Tithe and all, those are consequences of having an encounter with Jesus. Not the other way, that's what has happened. People are flipped around. Solas Christus, Jesus Christ alone. The next one is Sola Fide. Faith alone. Faith alone is the instrument through which we receive the alien righteousness of Christ. Alien because it's not ours. Our righteousness is by faith, it's not by work. There is nothing that we can do that we may be righteous before God. Nothing. Through faith in Christ, we get that great and marvelous exchange where Christ takes our sin and our penalty on the cross and we receive His perfect, His spotless, His righteousness. Now, the problem we are having today is that righteousness has been defined. It is not an act of faith. It is an act of works. Things you do. We should work out righteousness. Let me correct myself. We should act out acts of righteousness because we have received the divine righteousness. Any other act of righteousness before receiving the divine righteousness is null and void. It will take you nowhere. It has no place as far as God is concerned. Righteousness comes from God through Christ and by faith. The other solar is solar gratia, grace alone. If the work of Christ is the basis of our right standing before God, and we are justified by God, not on the basis of our works, but only through faith in the works of His Son. Then it follows that our salvation is by grace and grace alone. So does Russia. Period. And finally, we have sola Deo Gloria. To God only. To God alone be the glory. And that's this is what it means. If God is the only definition of our salvation, then He alone is to be magnified for His magnificent grace. His sovereign grace. God and only. God only. 
I am a pastor. I'm a reverend. And I work with pastors. And bishops. Who I can tell you, in their minds, they think they are Jesus Christ. The way they behave. And the way they want us to treat them.
is sufficient. And then the scripture, you talk about Surah Scripture, what does it mean to us? That the scripture is clear or has clarity good enough for everybody, everywhere, of every tribe or, or language all over the world. It's clear as long as they hear it in the language they understand. Of course, that doesn't mean that we don't need pastors, we don't need to read books that are written about the scriptures. No, 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 that's not the point. No, but the point is, even without those books, the Bible is enough to give you what you need as far as godliness is concerned. Yeah. It's enough. And it's clear. In other words, everybody can hear the word. I remember going to Bambalezo and there's this Shosho who was preaching. Rabbi, she spoke just to give a testimony and share a few things. And she spoke and said, uh, Somebody read for me. I can't remember the verses. But she had this clarity of understanding. And I could tell she could not read. She had not gone to school, so she could not read. But she had this clarity and understanding of the scripture. She knew what the Bible says and what it means. But she cannot read. And no social. But the word, the moment she had the word in her language, it was clear enough for her to stand up before people and tell them about God. Some of them to school. That's what it means. That you, in your own room, you can read the Bible and hear God speaking to you. Because it is clear. That's why we have Bible translation. So that everybody from any corner to the other corner of the world, they hear God speaking in their language. Because the Bible is clear enough for everyone. We, we read the same Bible in Sunday school. I teach in Sunday school myself. If I was not here, I would be in a Sunday school class now. We teach, we read the same Bible to the kids. And they understand. We read the same to you, university students. You understand. That's what it means. That we, we want just to make sure that life is, is, is going on well. Um, you know, things like um, some of the rules that we have set. I'm looking for a good example that you have set in the church that people should follow. Um, and those, those are good things that, but, but, but the point is that not all the doctrines that we have or believe in are actually uh, written clearly in the Bible. The source view does not mean that we may simply ignore you know, the richness of the Christian tradition in the way we interpret the scripture. Traditions. Traditions are good. Traditions are things like we preachers we put on collar. Uh, weddings we put on a white gown. Those are traditions. We put on a ring the wedding. Those are traditions. But there's no way the Bible says that you put on a ring when you're wedding. I've not seen that. I've not seen anywhere the Bible says you put on a gown, red gown, when you're wedding. And I've not seen anywhere the Bible says that preachers should put on collars and bishops should be in uh, uh, maroon shirts and they should carry the, the big stick and a big uh, cross on their bellies. The Bible does not say those things. But we do that. And I encourage you to do that. On your wedding day, make sure that you put on a ring, put on a white gown, white. Don't put a cream one, white. It signifies purity. Yeah. When the bishops are in those maroon shirts, fine. Even me, when I become one, I put it on. I put it on him. I will not say uh, this is not in the speech. I will not say that. Those things they help us to bring order in the church. They they compose a structure.
structural formulation that governs how the church is run, including identifying levels and offices and roles and duties. They make us have a meaning on things, like a wedding. They give us a meaning. How then do you differentiate between a couple's stay and a church wedding? They, they give us that clarity. So it's important. Those traditions are good. And not all traditions are good anyway. But here we are talking about the good traditions. So that scripture does not mean that all truth of every kind is found in the scripture. In the Bible here, we will never find anything to do with balancing sheets in accounting or informatics or AI or things like biology or robotics. You will not find it. So you need to study elsewhere well, those things. They are not in the Bible. That's why you're in school. And so if you cannot say, we are there the Bible and the Bible is all that I need to have the vision of God, I have the mind of Christ. Well, you will fail, the church will need to fail, even your family will fail. So the Bible does not continue, contain every truth of every kind, including things to do with governance. If you are a leader, go and sit in a leadership class, learn the arts and the skills of leading people. The Bible has something to do with that. In fact, most of the things you hear, they come from the scripture. But there is annotation from other sources that are very helpful. So that scripture doesn't mean that the light of nature or natural revelation fails to proclaim the truth to men for which they are held accountable and may be condemned. What the Bible is talking, I mean what this is talking about, talking about what the Bible says in Psalm 19, where it says, nature proclaims the glory of God to every nation, every language, that nobody can miss what the nature is proclaiming about the glory of God. Everywhere. And that's why nobody, even those who have never heard the gospel, will have an excuse before God. So, this is saying, the people, uh, the fact that nature has a way of telling people about God, we don't say that is not important. No. In natural sense, it confirms or it firms up that truth that the natural revelation is given to humankind. Hallelujah. And then, so as well, does not mean the work of the Spirit, uh, does not mean that the work of the Spirit in understanding the Scripture is unnecessary. We need the Spirit of God. The Bible says that the Spirit of God gives or testifies with our spirits that we are children of God. There is a testimony. There is a communication. There are things the Spirit of God must tell us. If you know the Word of God, you know the Word of God, and you have the Spirit of God, if I come here and purport to be speaking the Word of God, the Spirit of God will tell you, no, <laughs> that guy is telling me, he's saying these things. You know? You know what happened in Shakapola? What happened to the people who are following TV Joshua? Tells me one thing about those people. They didn't have the Spirit of God and they didn't know the Scripture. In fact, Jesus told the, the Pharisees and the church leaders of the, of the day, you are in error because you do not know the Scripture nor the power of God. Those two is actually the Scripture and for us the Holy Spirit, the power of God. So we cannot say, ah, me, I know the word of God. I don't know those things you are talking of, the Holy Spirit. Me, I'm done. The word of God is enough. People in their natural state can turn around the word of God and make it something else. Like we have just mentioned. Shakahola, T.B. Joshua, and so many. In fact, this city, this city of Nairobi, has so many of the T.B. Joshua in this city now. As we speak now, in this city. People are flocking there in thousands, thousands, hearing a lot of spiritual nonsense in the name of God. And those preachers are in this city. If you have the Spirit of God, and you know this one, you cannot be lied to. And some of those people have their TV station, which are always telling those nonsense when you open those, you turn to those TV stations. 
When the word of God is never read, it's always miracles. Miracles. Where is the place of the word of God? Did you know T.P. Joshua never held one baptism ceremony all the years he was preaching? You and I know what, how important baptism is. That Jesus Christ himself was baptized. But here comes a fellow who does not mention people not doing it. And people follow him. If you know the word of God and you have the spirit of God, do not be misled. I'm telling you, there is, <laughs> there is something about the spirit of God. It's like he's, the spirit of God, I don't know how to put this. Because he disturbs you. He nags you. Literally, both are in you. If you have the spirit of God, even if you are walking in sin and you have the spirit of God, my friend, before you, the spirit of God lets you go, he will bother you. He will trouble you. He will wake you up at night. Wake you up at night to tell you to pray and repent. God will, I mean, he'll send people. And when people are speaking, you hear him telling you, I will tell you, that's what I was talking about. You hear the prophet, the trap, he will trouble you until you reform. That's how the spirit of God is. And so you, we can never say, no, we know the scripture, we don't need the Holy Spirit. No. We need the Spirit of God to help us. And finally, you can never say, because of what you call in theological terms, um, there are methods of interpretation, and there's one which is called the, the grammatical historical where we grammatical historical method of interpretation of the Bible. That is, when you're reading the Bible, you ask questions like, who are the people who are living at that, that time? And what kind of language are they using? And what are the things that are happening at that time that informs how this word is written or this story is written? Which may, in many cases, not applicable today. So that we have an understanding. Then why were they doing things that way? An example is when David, not David, Joseph came out of the jail to go to interpret the dream to the king in Egypt. He had to be shaven. And the reason was to be shaven because hair in the Egyptian society was repugnant, was something unadorable, it's not acceptable. And so he had to be shaven because, and if you look at traditional pictures about Egypt, you realize almost all of them, people don't have hair, and I mean men don't have hair. Because hair was not something that did go well with the society. So that helps us understand why then it was necessary for him to be shaved. And also, when we see the pictures that we see, we understand why is it that all the Egyptian photos they show people don't have hair? Now we understand. Now we cannot say then that kind of interpretation of the Bible is the only thing that we need so that once we know the people, we know what was happening there, we understand the scripture, and therefore we don't need it. And it's because we just talk about we need the Holy Spirit. Because what was written by Samuel, for instance, how can it be relevant to us today, thousands of years later? It's only the Spirit of God that makes it relevant to you and me, who are living in the digital age. And therefore we have to actually say, okay, God, I have the word here. I have the understanding of the word. But Lord, I pray that you make this word relevant to my situation now. Praise the Lord. What have we said? We've said that we must read the Bible. Believe the Bible. And practice the Bible. Basically, that's what we're saying. And we must allow this Bible to inform everything we do in matters pertaining our faith, our practice, and our body. This is the sole authority God has given us. And maybe you are here and you are not born again. And this story of talking about um, the word of God may actually be very far away, far away from you. Because you actually don't even have the God you are talking about who wrote or spoke this word. But this God is gracious and merciful. And every day that comes, like today, 28th of February, uh, January 2024, it came 
as far as God is concerned, and as far as your, your soul is concerned, so that you, if you don't know him, you may know him. But because after all is said and done, all, and I mean all, the only thing that remains and that counts is what relationship you have or did you have with God. When you are at the deathbed, when you have nothing counts, your relationship doesn't count, your family doesn't count, your status doesn't count, what counts? <coughs> the only thing that counts at that point is your relationship with God. The only thing that counts five minutes after death, two minutes after death, one minute after you close your eyes and your heartbeat is dead and your brain has, 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 has gone to, to silence. One minute after death, the only thing that counts is how were you related to Jesus Christ. Nothing else matters. That's why we tell everybody to come to Christ. And it's not us, it is the Bible. So if you're here and you don't know Him, and you know it, you have an opportunity to give your life to Christ. Right here, then you Christ. If you're there and you want to give your life to Christ, just lift up your hand. Now we pray with you. We'll all welcome you to the house of faith and you'll experience the love of God that you have ever imagined. Anyone? Anybody? No? Right, let's pray. Your word is a lamp to my feet and the light to my heart. How can a young man live their lives in a godly way, in a pure way? It's by hiding your word in their hearts. The heavens and the earth will pass away, but your word will remain forever. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by your word coming from your mouth. This is the truth about your word, Lord. And today, we pray that you help us to read and believe and practice your word. Because it's only in your word where you are. It's only your word that binds you in your promises. And it's only in your word we have life, life eternal through Christ Jesus. And so we pray for everyone here who heard this message. May you follow these words of God with your spirit as you minister to each according to their needs and according to their situation, even this afternoon. We thank you for giving us an opportunity to hear you and to hear even about your word. We thank and we bless you. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you put your hands together and clap for Jesus?